All right, wonderful. Well, then I'll get into it. From what I understand, we are going to be going over Daniel chapter, uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel, chapter by chapter. We're going to be looking at all sorts of different exciting things. Honestly, this is one of my favorite books in the entire Bible. This is a uh, this is truly, um, this is going to be a great great privilege and a blessing. Today we're going to be starting in Daniel chapter 1, and we'll see really how practical uh, this book is. But before we begin, I'd like to begin with another word of prayer. So um, let's all who are able, let's say a word of prayer together. Dear Father in heaven, I pray that you'll please be with us as we study. I pray that you'll open to us your word. And I know that there are people here that are, have questions, that have concerns, that have um, desire to know answers. I pray that answers will be found today to their questions. I pray that we invite heavenly angels to be here with us as we search for the truth. As for hid treasures, please direct us to where you would have us to go. We thank you so much. We love you, and we pray that um, you will guide us. In Jesus' name, amen. So today, let's, um, let's just open up our Bibles in Daniel chapter 1 and read a little bit of the context. Daniel chapter 1, be, beginning in verse 1, the Bible states, In the third year the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem, oh, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, into the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. And verse 3 is very key. The king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes. So he's looking for specific people of the royalty and education because verse 4 we we can find that it's not the children that we think of today like seven eight nine year old but the children also include like the youth and the young adults because verse 4 it says children in whom was no blemish but well favored and skillful in wisdom cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans so Daniel and his friends, they already, had, they already had been educated. They have received this mental culture and training. They were capable of being counselors to the king. That's what he was bringing in. And it's very interesting that even today, um, Babylon is searching for the children of Israel, the youth of our day, to bring them into their schools. And they're learning to teach them of the tongue and, Cal and, and learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. We, we see that Daniel was taken captive with some of his friends. He wasn't the only one in Babylon that was taken captive and to be in the king's council. This is very key because many times we think of Daniel and his three friends, and that's the only ones we think of, but there were several of the children of Israel. But why is it that Daniel was able to... Why was Daniel able to um, kind of be set apart and why did God really highlight his experience and the example it was because he passed the very first test found in chapter one it was a test on the point of the appetite and we'll see that from this chapter is where he found uh, he was given the gift of prophecy through this experience through being faithful so in part of this training in Babylon the verse 5 it says the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meats and of the wine which he drank so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king i find it very interesting because here in the kingdom of babylon we know they they worship these these pyramids and they have a lot of these pyramid shaped um temples and here it was with all of the education and training of 
resources, and the resources that Babylon has, they thought, they thought that with the, uh, the nation of Babylon, the education of Babylon, with all their learning, they thought that meat was nourishing. Did you notice that? They thought that wine was nourishing. But in reality, um, because Daniel understands, or Daniel understood the principles found in God's word, he had a different approach. But let, let's keep reading in, um, I, I, kind of, I kind of think of it like a, uh, you know, like the food pyramid that we have today? Where they put meat and then the cheese and the dairy on this thing. Today, they're still trying to say that this is essential. If you don't give milk to your children, then they're going to have weak bones. When science research has shown that people who drink milk large amounts as they grow older, the milk actually, um, the calcium that's found in milk is coated in phosphorus, so our body is not able to actually assimilate or to utilize the calcium that's found in the milk. And because it has a lot of phosphoric acid, in order to dilute the acidic environment that creates in the body, the, phosphor the calcium, the minerals, have to come out of our bones and organs to try to balance the pH in our blood. And so calcium is actually being robbed from our bones in order to deal, to try to balance out the issues that have been created through drinking the milks of others. Like cow's milk is designed to make a little born calf to grow into a two ton or this very massive large creature. That's not the type of milk that God has given for us to be drinking. But, um, and even with the wine, they're still saying that um, with like a little wine, it's good for your heart. I don't know if anyone, has anyone ever heard that before? You can let us know in the comments. Wow. Um, wine is actually is rotten grapes, and it's and it damages the brain. You know, there is a quote that I think you guys will really like, and it's found in um, the book Temperance. It was page twelve. It's really profound. Here it is, Temperance, page twelve. Oh, I could even send it to you guys. I like these chats. When I read this, I was like, wow, that makes so much sense. Satan gathered the fallen angels together to devise some way of doing the most possible evil to the human family. One proposition after another was made, till finally Satan himself thought of a plan. He would take the fruit of the vine, so grapes, also wheat, and other things, given by God as food, he would convert them into poisons which would ruin man's physical, mental, and moral powers and so overcome the senses that Satan should have full control. Under the influence of liquor, men would be led to commit crimes of all kinds. Through perverted appetite, the world would be made corrupt. By leading men to drink alcohol, Satan would cause them to descend lower and lower in the scale. Can you believe that? Think about it. Imagine with me. Satan is kicked out of heaven. He sees man who is this, the crown of God's creation, made in the image of God. And because he fell into misery, he wants everyone to have misery like him. And he thinks... How he, he gathers all the satanic fiends together in this council to try to know how can we do the most damage to the human family? How can we do the worst plan that we possibly can to bring the greatest amount of suffering that is possible? And then Satan himself. I, I can see different people saying, like, oh, well, what if we do this? It's like, no, that's not, that's not insidious enough. What if... Uh, what if we, we do that? And they're like, no, that's not enough. And then Satan himself, with his wily mind, his perverted intellect, he thought of a plan. I've got it. We're going to take the grapes. We're going to convert them into poison, allowing it to uh, rot. And then 
we are going to give this uh, liquid, this liquor, and give it to man in the form of alcohol and beer so that people, so that we can have an open door to come in and to um, have our way with them. And um, and if, if we read 1 Peter chapter uh, 4, verse 12, If you can turn with me, um, <clears throat> actually, First Peter chapter five, verse eight. First Peter five eight. Notice what the Bible says. I find it very interesting regarding liquor. Peter said, "Be what? Be sober. Be vigilant. Why? Why should we be sober? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion." walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So the reason why we are to protect our sobriety and allow nothing that would affect our sobriety to uh, be entered into our body is because Satan himself is seeking whom he could devour. That's why uh, drugs and alcohol, they open the doors for demon possession. That's why in many uh, different stores, they're called spirits. It, could there be a connection between spirit possession and alcohol, then possessed of demons taking the lives of others, and all the crimes that have been committed under the influence of the inebriate minds? Satan well knows this, and that's why uh, through the Babylonian teachings, they're trying to say, tell us that a little bit of wine is good for your heart, when in reality, it's not... The wine is poison created by Satan. Grape juice, the great, the pure uh, fruit of the grape, that is what God gave us. Um, there is another verse which, which we could see this blessing in Isaiah chapter, Isaiah 65 verse 8. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine, so that's grape juice, is found in the cluster and one saith, destroy it not. Why? For a blessing is in it. So will I do for my servants' sake, that I will not destroy them all. So God says, don't destroy the grapes, the new wine, where they cluster. There's a blessing in it. And part of that, and then and Peter said, take a little bit of grape juice for your stomach's sake. There is uh, one of the reasons why they say that wine is good for your heart is because of the resveratrol, which is found in the grape. It's also found in the wine. But the fact is, resveratrol is found in higher amounts in the actual grape juice without all the negative side effects of the wine and damage to the, to the liver and um, all the other problems that come with, with that. Um, the, so Michael was able to share with us just now a whole lot of verses about what the Bible truly says about wine. So if you have any questions after reading this, uh, then I'm going to be really surprised because there's a lot of really clear directions here. I find it interesting, Proverbs 23, 29, and 35 says, Who hath woe? Who hath sorrow? Who hath contentions? Who hath, what is it? Babylonians. Who hath wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes. So the drinking of wine is associated with Babylon. Now, are we not studying about the nation of Babylon, the diet of Babylon? This is even in Revelation 17, we see Babylon, the mother of harlots, having the wine in the cup of her fornication in her hand, and she's giving it to all the nations. So they're giving, so in short, we recognize that from Scripture, what's better than the red wine is the grape juice. And that's what God would have us to be taking. And did Daniel understand this? Of course. We can continue to read in verse uh, Daniel chapter 1 and verse 6 through 8. Oh, actually, before we go, I wanted to acknowledge what... Um, 
I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to pronounce this wrong. Ilar? Ilar? They say, we drink most cow milk in the world. Norwegian women are also on the top in the world with osteoporosis. A paradox in the claims is we need calcium from cow's milk. That's a really powerful statement right there, being able to recognize those who drink the most cow's milk or the most milk from these animals are also the highest in osteoporosis. That's really powerful. What um, Michael is sharing that he talked with uh, a Muslim who had some interesting comments. What comments did the Muslim have to share with you, Brother Michael? While he's while he's sharing with us, I want to read uh, Daniel 1, 6 through 8. It, I really like the way that Daniel responded. It says, Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. This is such a great example of someone who's probably in their um, late teens, maybe 18, 19, 17 years old, him and his friends, a purpose in their heart. That really shows the principle of success in anything. You have to decide that you are not going to falter no matter what happens. Without him purposing, he wouldn't have stood up for that. And it was a preparation that he received in childhood in that his family studied the, the prophets, the prophecies of Jeremiah, a contemporary of his day. But because they were studying these things and the scriptures before made the word of God their counselor, he was able to claim the promises and decide to refuse this. And I want to look um, what were some of the, what do you think some of the promises that Daniel had available to him while he was um, while while he was refusing the king's meat? The um, Michael was sharing that um, the Muslim he had talked to also pointed out some of the spiritual elements of alcohol and how you can get drunk and murder someone and not even remember. Yeah, some people call them like blackout drunks. They go to the bar, just totally blackout. They get into some bar fight. They come home. They wake up. They they might even wake up in someone else's house. They've got cuts and bruises and blood on their shirt, and they're like, "What happened yesterday?" And then their friends go in there to pick them up and, and remind the person, it's like, you did this and this, you said that, you went to this place, to that person, you went to the biggest person in, in the entire bar, why did you do that? And they're like, I don't remember any of it. They just blacked out. And um, there's a there's a spiritualist who was, there's an ex-spiritualist, it might have been Roger Monroe. I don't know if any... If any of you guys have heard of Roger Monroe before, trip into the spiritual nat supernatural, I encourage you to watch that video, look it up on YouTube. Let me know in the comments if you're familiar with that testimony. It's about a man who was a spiritualist who started with seances and he went on and he um, he eventually got really high into some spiritual, like speaking to de demons and knowing that they're fallen angels and knowing that he's talking to Lucifer. But basically... Afterwards, he did some Bible studies with a Bible worker, had some spiritual attacks, but the Lord overcame. He became a mighty prayer warrior, rich in faith, because he saw the spiritual realm, and he's, he knows the power of God. And he linked himself up with the one who knows no failure, so he shares his testimony about coming out of the supernatural world. And one of the things that he brought out was that um, to the degree you check out is the degree that these demons check in. So our, our possession is in proportion to how we check out. And checking out is different. Um, it's not just alcohol. Checking out could be indulging our food, I mean our mouths with food that even 
though the quality of the food is good, the quantity may be bad. Or maybe checking out could be just aimless, aimlessly watching television like a zombie in this hypnotic just state with all the stuff that goes through. Or checking out could be listening to the music and, and just allowing your mind to check out of reality. There's a lot of things that we use to try to fill this void or to try to distract our mind from um, the thoughts that, that torment us sometimes. And, and we can check out even with good things, but that is going to invite an um, unhelpful influence into our life. And then and Michael mentioned that it's fascinating that in Muslim nations, alcohol is illegal. That is very fascinating. It, I know that the early um, Adventist pioneers, Alan White, they were very first and foremost in the, like, the foregrounds of the temperance movement. They were totally against prohibition. And uh, they were really trying to keep that the prohibition w would stay and they would prohibit all alcohol in America, but it still went forward. When I went to school, like I went to school in the public school, so unfortunately uh, there was Babylonians that were trying to teach me the learning and tongue of the Chaldeans, and um, they actually taught that like prohibition was a bad thing, and prohibition was the cause of organized crime, and that's how the mafia came up and all these gangs, and because of like le illegalizing alcohol in America, then all these like crime crime mobsters came up, which at first I was like, well, that, that sounds like prohibition was bad. Yeah, let's legalize it so that there's not all those drugs, like so all those problems. But in hindsight, after reading like the word of God and seeing what he says, I was like, no, that was bad. Because sure, because organized crime is going to happen no matter what. There's been mafias since the days of the dark ages. Just look at the Catholic Church and the way that they handle things, and even the Sanhedrin, how they counseled against Christ to put him to death. There it has been organized crime since, probably since the days of Cain murdering his brother Abel. That prohibition is not the cause of organized crime. This is, uh, that was just false teachings. And I'm so thankful for the word of God. The entrance of thy words giveth light, giveth understanding to the simple. Um, Joern says the word alcohol is derived from an Arabic word originally meaning evil spirit. That's really fascinating. Fascinating. Um, and then Sissel says that's the way Satan works. He will always have some good thing in with a false. It's a mixture of good and evil, exactly. Just like that resveratrol and the wine. It it wasn't like I like to remind people, it wasn't the tree of evil. It wasn't the tree of the knowledge of evil that led, that brought sin into the world. Satan didn't deceive Eve and Adam with just pure evil darkness. It was a mixture of truth and error, of good and evil, and that's what made it so potent in its deception. It seemed good, but it wasn't. And we really want to be um, we really want to be careful of the things that we are we are studying and that we're putting into our body. And I really like uh, Michael. He just sent us a article about some Ellen White quotes and what she says on prohibition. Quite a hot topic. So, looking again at some of the well, I want to ask, what do you think are some of the uh, the promises or the teachings found in the Word of God? that Daniel and his friends were able to study and see and to claim so that they wouldn't receive, so that they refuse the king's meat. Um, that's um, Joe Yes was asking about if the word alcohol comes out of evil spirits. According to Joran, I'm not sure where the reference is, but uh, they were stating that alcohol is derived, the English word alcohol is derived from an Arabic word. And the word in Arabic that alcohol is derived from, the definition in Arabic is evil spirit. So that's, 
I, I haven't fact checked that. I'm just reading the comment. So that's what he said. And that's very interesting. I'd like to look into that. So keep in mind that Daniel would have the prophecies, the counsels in the Word of God before his time. So, hey, if anything comes to mind, please share it in the comments. Let it. Let me know. Let's let's study together and see what what prop promises could Daniel and his friends be claiming. Let's look at Proverbs chapter twenty three. Let's go to Proverbs twenty three verse one. Let's see how relevant this is. The Bible says, "The wisest man that ever lived said, when thou sittest to eat with a what? A ruler. Now was Nebuchadnezzar a ruler? Oh yes, he was. And not only was he the ruler, but he was actually giving these captives a portion of the king's meats. It was the ruler's food and table that they were being invited to eat with. So for Daniel to say, look, I don't, I, I'm in a purpose in my heart, I can't have that. That is not something that I will do. Notice what the Bible says, consider diligently what is before thee. And put a knife to thy throat, if thou be a man given to appetite. Be not desirous of his dainties, for they are deceitful meats. How profound is this concept that stating, even at a king's table, it would be better to die than to indulge your appetites. That his meat, his dainties, a rich man's food, it is deceitful. So, the, um, I mean, this is, I, I'm not sure for, I'm not for certain, but I can only imagine that Daniel and his friends were claiming this promise as they were going forward because they could have lost their life. Not only them, but the prince of the eunuch for requesting that they would eat something different, he could have been beheaded. That's just how this haughty, um, spirited, ruler this pagan ruler was but how often do we uh, go visit with our families and we're eating and then they prepare something and they they have something on the table and, and we know that we don't want to eat that and we know we shouldn't be eating that we're like well maybe just maybe a little bit uh, I I don't want to I don't want to offend them or I don't want to hurt their feelings. They made this for me, and I didn't tell them that I eat something different. Or okay, I'll just do it this time, but I'm gonna not do it later. Maybe I'll, I'll ask for forgiveness later. Like, how often do people go through that when when they visit with with strangers? They're not even sitting at a ruler's table. That if you refuse their food, you'll be put to death. I'm talking about families and friends and visitors. When we're eating with them or we're going out to eat, are we considering diligently what is put before us? I encourage us all that we can dare to be a Daniel, even if we're standing alone. And claim the promise of Proverbs 23. So Korn, uh, or Jorn said, um, and the Quran, the jinns are evil spirits. They love people to give and the destructive ways. Yeah, Dijin, if I'm not mistaken, that's kind of where the word genie comes from, or Dijini, or uh, those, those are the similar words. Yeah, the, the Quran has a lot of similarities. They don't, I, I like being able to relate with the Muslims because uh, we do have a lot in common. Whenever I meet, like, a Muslim, and I perceive, like, maybe they don't, like, drink or smoke or and I, I find that kind of interesting. And then when I realize they're Muslim, instantly I want to try to find that common ground. I'm like, oh, it's like we too, we don't eat pork, shellfish, smoke, or drink, and we dress modestly. It's like we have a lot in common. And as you show, and we don't worship idols, like these are the things that we have in common. Because the Muslims, when they think of Christianity, many times they're thinking Catholic. But they don't real and so a lot of um, Christian missionaries like the in the Arab nations it just Christianity is totally cut out. People are not having success except for Seventh Day Adventist missionaries. God is working in amazing ways over in the Middle East right now, 
And the Seventh-day Adventists, are, when they're like, are you a Christian? They're asking, like, are you a, uh, are you basically, are you a Catholic? Or even, like, the Protestant America in its apostasy going towards Rome, still worshiping idols, eating unclean meats, drinking alcohol, doing things that the Bible condemns and the Quran condemns. So when we approach them, I like to say that uh, we're, because the Quran talks about the people of the book and that we are, some of the Adventists are mentioned in the Quran as a prophecy of the people that they should listen to. So we, I, I tell them about what we have in common we don't eat meat. I mean, we don't eat the, the porks and the shellfish. We don't drink alcohol, smoke cigarettes. Women dress modestly. There's, um, and we don't uh, worship idols. And instantly they're like, whoa, so then you guys aren't the Christian that they have in mind. We're Seventh-day Adventists. And when, they, when we say that, it kind of lets the guards down. And they're more open to listening to what we have to say. Um, Yeah, so another another counsel regarding the um, the meats that he ate, he said he didn't want to defile himself. How did Daniel know that he was not to defile himself? A lot of times people, um, well actually, let's go to Leviticus chapter 3. Leviticus 3.17, it's very interesting text here. God has given instruction regarding this. Um, the Word of God says, it shall be a perpetual statue. What kind of statue? It's a perpetual statue for your generations throughout all your dwelling that you should eat neither what? Fat nor blood. So the word perpetual means forever. It doesn't end. It's everlasting. It just perpetually goes on. So this was a statue, a law, a health law from God that they were not to eat fat or blood. Never has God given permission to do that. So um, this, but the thing about flesh meat is that the things that give it flavor are the fat, blood, and uric acid. And without these three things, the meat would be kind of tough and not as pleasant to the taste. So our modern, our modern methods of butchering, um, especially industrial like butchering of the foods, they, uh, they, kill, they kill the cow, they raise the cows on, on corn so that they could bulk up as soon as they possibly can. They pump them full of antibiotics and hormones to try to keep them alive so that they don't die before they can get fat. And some of them do die, but they ship those off to the butcher. They, they're dead upon arrival. And then they still cut into the, the pigs, the, the cows, the, um, the, 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 the chickens, the different meats that they're they're selling, and as they're cutting into the cows, it's like the bladder opens, the fecal matter and the uric acid sprays um, gets on the on the meat, and um, then by the time from the time that it gets to the butcher to the grocery store, a lot of times that could be, there could be months in between that, and and because of that, they have to pump it full of preservatives. So by the time that you eat or you grab the meat off of the shelf, it in order to make it look like it's actual like meat and it's not rotting and decaying, it's the preservatives that people are eating and they actually add blood to it. So it doesn't look all gray and dried out and, and old like it really is. And it, it is really disgusting as you think about it because um, God really knew what he was saying when he said that we don't eat the fat or the blood. And one reason why he says not to eat the fat is because animal products are the only source of dietary cholesterol that we can possibly find. How many people are dying from heart attacks, strokes, and all this cardiovascular problems? It's, it's animal cholesterol. Our body naturally produces cholesterol, and it produces enough that, that 
we don't need extra from our diet or from the, the meat that we are eating. Uh, and yeah, it, it's not strange that people are getting sick. It's really as simple as cause and effect. You eat the fat, you eat the meat with the fat, and you're going to receive the consequence of a disease. It's an eff disease is an effort of nature to free the system from conditions that result from a violation of the laws of health. So when we violate this health law found in Leviticus 3.17, disease is the sure result. So in case of sickness, the cause should be ascertained, unhealthful conditions should be changed, then nature is to be assisted to reestablish right conditions in the system. So um, also with the blood, there is there's a very important reason why God said that as well. But in order to find that out, let's go over to Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, it says, um, Genesis 9, 3, this is going back to where God gave permission to eat meat. And notice that there is a there are some conditions upon meat. And people will quote this when you start talking about it, saying that, oh, God gave permission, or we can eat meat. The Bible says we can. It's like, and then, but, but they don't really, they take it out of context. They don't really see what is this verse actually saying. Let's read it together. Genesis 9.3. Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. So right here, they're like, anything that moves, the snakes, the raccoons, the mouses, the, the pigs, the anything, we, everything that moves, it shall be meat for you. And they're like, there it is. But notice, let's keep reading. Even as the green herb have I given you all things. All right, now question. If you're walking through the forest, can you just go out and eat every single green herb that you see and put that into your food and be sustained? Absolutely not. What would happen? Some of the green thing, herbs in the field are poisonous and it will kill you. Some will kill you immediately. Some will kill you slowly, but it's still a sure poison. Like tobacco in any form is not going to be good for you. God has not given us tobacco. When God created the world, he created things good. He said, it, after the first day, it was good. After the second day, it was good. After all the days, God created all things, and he said it was very good. So God created things good. And in the parable of the sower that went forth to sow, the question was asked in Matthew 13, if the good man only sowed the good seed, the wheat, then from whence came it the tares? Where did the weeds come from? Where did these nox, noxious plants come from? And Jesus in the parable responded, An enemy hath done this. It was not God who created tobacco or who created these noxious weeds. An enemy hath done this. And even the word Satan means adversary or it means enemy. It, it's Satan who has perverted. He takes, he cannot create anything. He takes God's creation, like what we just read in Temperance, page 12. He takes the fruit of the vine and perverts it into alcohol, and now you have wine, and now it's a mixture of good and evil, and it is uh, poison to our, to our bodies, our minds, health, our bodies and souls. So like, in like manner, there are some noxious weeds in the green herbs, and you can't just go out and eat them. They have a purpose, but their purpose is not for food. Genesis 1.29, God has gave us the fruits, nuts, grains, and vegetables. These are the diets that comprise uh, for us to eat. Now, um, so you can apply that like manner with every moving thing that liveth. You can't just eat every, like when God gave them permission, in context, this was in the flood. So the world was just wiped out by a flood. There's not a lot of green foliage and plants. The bones of the earth have been broken up, and now they're forming these massive mountains and grand canyons through the world. So it's a desolate place as an emergency diet. God gave permission to eat meat. 
but it wasn't to be sustained on meat. That was um, not his plan. He said, you can eat the meat, but there's a condition. Genesis 9.4, but the flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Did you catch that? He said, you can eat the meat, but not with the, not with the life, the, the, uh, the blood, because the life is in the blood. This is what I believe Daniel and his friends understood. The, the blood is what transports all of the, um, all of the uh, nutrients and, and really even the diseases. It, it transports the toxins out of the body, the hormones out of the body. When we're eating the animal hormones, we're eating like the, the, it, if you've ever heard the phrase, you are what you eat. When you eat beast, you become, it strengthens your animal passions, your animal propensities. Uh, and that's a lot of people who have severe anger issues, you'll find that if they stop eating meat, their mood greatly decreases. Like their anger, their hypersensitivity, they become mellow and normal and healthy members of society that you can really link arms with and be like, hey, I can be your friend. Like you're. You're a pretty swell person where before they're just irritable and angry and nothing can, can satisfy them and they're hard people to get along with. God saw fit. His laws are not restrictions. His laws, he knows with cause and effect what's going to bring us the greatest blessing, the greatest joy. And he wants us to have life that we might have life abundantly. And what I find very interesting is God continues, what would happen if we eat the blood or which is the life thereof, it says, verse 5, And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of every man, and at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. So would you agree that the word life could be substituted with health? Right? It, your life, your health. Yes. You lose your health, you lose your life. Here, it says that if we eat the blood, then God is going to require our life or our health. And now our health is going to be diminishing. That was a promise. Not only that, if God is going to require our blood, then Christ's sacrifice is made void because I want to be covered by the blood of the Lamb. I want Christ's blood to be required in, in my place. I want to accept Him as my personal Savior so that His blood could be required. If God's going to require my life for the life of these that I'm taking, then um, that's a very serious thing. God wants, God gave His Son. He left heaven. You left the worship of angels and um, he was the monarch of the universe to be born in a stable, one of the most filthiest places you could be born, among animals. He was treated as we deserved, and he, with his stripes we are healed, and through his poverty we became rich. He, he endured the sufferings and afflictions. He was touched with the feelings of our infirmities, and he endured all of this, and he gave his son to die for us so that we... So our blood would not be required because he loves us and he wants to, to give us a not only a peaceful life in this world, but especially the life to come. And um, God has plans that are going to be a lot more um, joyous when we learn to trust him and keep him in all that we do. So reading Genesis 9 some people say that like these restrictions on eating the fat and the blood that was only to the Jews and as though the body the cardiovascular system the lymphatic system and the the pulmonary systems and all, all the as though like the body of a Jew is different than the body of a gentile or that maybe the the Hebrews had a different um health need than like a Norwegians or an Americans or 
whatever. But um, we see just from the book of Genesis here, this is in the days of Noah before there was ever a Jew on earth. And God is saying that there should be a restriction of not eating the blood with, and not only, so, so we see that this restriction does not just apply to the children of Israel. This is to every man, woman, and child throughout history. That was the same with Adam all the way to the second coming of Christ. We can even see in the New Testament church, if we go to, um, if we go to Acts chapter 16, it's, it's, it states very clearly, actually, let's read Acts, um, Acts 15 and verse 19. Acts 15, 19. I was looking for a verse because it, in the New Testament, it talks about these necessary things. <clears throat> but um, we can find it later. Acts 15, 19, and 20. So even the New Testament, dealing with the Gentiles, you and I, the Bible say, states, Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. So this is talking about New Testament Gentile Christians but that we write unto them that they, the Gentiles, you and I, abstain from pollutions of idols, from fornications, and from things strangled and from blood. So even in the, new, in the early church, there was the command that they should not eat things strangled or from blood. Now, consider the difference between the way that they would butcher or that they would slay the animals and sacrifice them so the pagans, they would create these like these uh, traps, these like nooses that would get the animal, unsuspecting animal, the hunter, and then it would wrap around their head and just hang them, and they would just strangle them. And they're they're thrashing around, they are squealing, they're hanging upside down, and they are um, they're they're freaked out, their adrenaline's all pumping, they're they're on fight or flight mode. They're like trying to save their life. And that's how they would kill the animals. So when you take the flesh of these animals, there's like adrenaline surging through the blood. And the blood is going like crazy. Um, and that is what's found in the burgers and in, in, the, um, in the steaks and the porks and these different things. And... Um, so we're actually eating adrenaline. So, like, it's no marvel that we are, um, that people are, there's an increase of, like, murder, idolatry, and, like, rape, and, and all these different, um, these, these passionate crimes. It's, it's increasing the animal propensities, the beast-like um, behavior, because the way that these animals are dying this gets transmitted into our our body and it affects us negatively. While the um, Hebrews, what they would do is they take the lamb, gently guiding them to the altar, and the lamb would lay there and they would slit the throat and it would drain the blood out. And as they would drain the blood, this was um, totally different from the way that the pagans would would sacrifice their animals and the way that the people of God would would uh, would handle their 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 meat offerings and their sacrifices. So even in the New Testament, we see that the Word of God it was before a Jew and after a Jew. God says the blood stay away from don't don't eat that. So Daniel understand stood these things. Going back to Daniel chapter one and verse nine. We could see that uh, he made a petition, and he asked. I really like the way that he um, I really like the way that he he requested this um, them to handle this. Now, God brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. 
And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? And then ye shall make me endanger my head to the king. So it's really a beautiful thing that when you serve God, and because of your integrity, and because of your your being faithful in the little things and your consistency, God will bring you in favor with the higher classes, in favor with the rulers and the captains like and the princes. Just like here, it was because of earning the respect, being conscientious towards the uh, prince of the eunuchs, that he was willing to endanger his life for Daniel and his friends. But he had that Babylonian education, so he thought, Whoa, if you don't eat the meats, you're you're gonna you won't where are you gonna get your protein? If you're not going to eat the meat, you're gonna be sick. If you don't drink what they give you, you're not your bones aren't gonna be strong, your heart's not gonna be strong. How can I request when the king himself is out of his kindness offering the very best food that he himself eats to you, and then you're gonna fail at the purpose and I'm going to be responsible. And so this is a really bold request from Daniel and his friends, but they knew to put a knife to their throat if they be a man given to appetite and to consider diligently what is set is before them when they sit at to eat with the ruler. So in doing that, God is going to honor those who honor him. And so he responds and he said then said Daniel to Melzar whom the prince of the eunuchs has said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. So he's asking for pulse and water. And when you look at the margins, I don't know if any of you guys have a marginal reading in your Bible for the word um, pulse, but it's interesting that it says... Um, the pulse is is plants, but even it says like leguminous plants. So it's kind of like like beans. Uh, not that they were just eating beans, but they were um, a plant-based protein source. They really knew that they didn't need it from the animals, from the meat, but that God has given the uh, enough protein in the plants. I mean, just think about a horse. A horse is just pure muscle. It is strong and massive. Where does the horse get its protein? From the plants. A gorilla. A gorilla is is like pure muscle. Again, it's massive. It's like a 300-pound gr uh, gorilla. Where does it get its protein from? They're vegetarian. They get it from plants. And they occasionally eat some insects too, but um, we see even nature, the, the largest mammal on the planet, an elephant, strictly vegetarian. If it's good for the horse, it's good for us. The uh, there, there's plenty of protein in the plants. If we, if and and the cows, how they get strong, they eat plants. So all we're doing is. The cow goes straight to the primary source, gets the protein, gets the nutrients from the plants and the density, assimilates it into their body so that they're able to, um, to digest and to utilize this and bring the nutrients throughout the body. And then we eat the pre-digested, filtered uh, nutrients, plant nutrients, in the form of a cow, in the form of an animal. And when we eat that, we're getting second-handed. So it depletes itself in how our body can actually use it. Why not just skip the middleman and go straight to the source? That's what Daniel's trying to do, and that's what God is asking us to do. So he's asking this, just, just give us 10 days. In verse 13, let thy, then let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of the ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fattier in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meats. Now, 
this is really this is amazing because one thing that you'll consistently see in the book of Daniel is the steadfast integrity even if he was alone was Daniel the only of the children of Israel that were brought into captivity no but why this inspiration only record these four men these four young men that stood up for their convictions that implies that much of the children of Israel they were um, they compromised they they did not stand for what they were taught and it really shows how important it is Daniel understood the importance of having good influences good friends to be around to support and the, the they refuse to compromise with the other children of Israel. And so it just shows that sometimes when you're standing for right, you're not going to be on the majority side. And there is few, the, the most people are on the Broadway to destruction, and few there be that find it. Or few there be that find the gates that leads to life. So Alar said that elk is the large king of Norwegian forests and eats only plants. There you go. Elks are a good example of plant-based nutrition. So then uh, when they tested him, it was amazing to see in verse 15 uh, the results. God really blessed them. Kind of going faster because we're getting towards the end. And at the end of the 10 days, their countenances appeared fairer and fattier in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meats. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And here it is, Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So I want you to know in context as we're going through the books of Daniel, I mean the chapters of, in the book of Daniel, know that all of these experiences would not even existed if Daniel did not choose life to purpose in his heart that he was not going to compromise no matter what. If Daniel had failed this test of appetite, the whole history of the Daniel would have been totally different. And we see that God honored Daniel with the gift of understanding visions and dreams and even the spirit of prophecy because he proved loyal and faithful on the point of appetite. If people try to tell you that it doesn't matter what you eat or it doesn't matter how you live or your health isn't important with your spirituality, just know that in the very, that it was it was food that brought sin into this world. God said, the day you eat thereof, thou shalt surely die. And then the very center of the word death is eat. So we don't want to find ourselves digging our graves with our forks, as many times is the case. Now, Verse 18, now at the end of the days, the king had said he should bring them in. And then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all manners of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times. Do you believe that? better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. And Daniel continued unto the first year of King Cyrus. So my appeal to you, my friends, is that God is not going to take away anything from us that is not going to be for our greatest benefit and our, and our own good. And when God takes away, God takes away things that we like for things that we love better. And he's always presenting us something better, something better. It's not just take, take, take. But I encourage you, there are substitutes for all sorts of things. You can find healthy alternatives for whatever God is saying. Like even if it's 
And remember, to the degree we check out is the degree that Satan checks in. I'm not just dealing with, with food. I'm dealing with appetite. Appetite might be the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It might be the, uh, the, anything that jives against the carnal spirit, the carnal heart. These are what God is trying to pull from our life. And we serve a mighty God. He is ready to give us something better. If he's, ready, if he's tugging your heart on the music, know that God has better music. If it's the things that you're viewing and you're watching, know that God is going to give it something better. And our success is going to be in proportionate to our consecration and self-denial towards God. That as we consecrate ourselves to Him and we surrender to Him, He's going to bring us to be as ten times wiser, ten times better than the Babylonians that don't have the light of the Bible and the spirit of prophecy that God has given to us. And I encourage us all that we can just continue to climb higher and be faithful in that which is least. Because, and I'll, and I'll end here on this verse in Luke chapter 16, verse 11. Luke, actually 16, verse 10. The Bible says, He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. So if it's your desire to be faithful in what God has given to you, be faithful with the light that you have, to walk in the light while he is in the light, then I invite you to say a word of prayer uh, with me today. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, I pray that you will, uh, I, I thank you for giving us the example of, of Daniel and the three Hebrew worthies. I pray that we too can be found faithful, that you can bring us in favor with the rulers of this world so that we can, like Paul, speak before the governors, through the kings and the, and the rulers. I pray that we, we know that in Revelation 10, 11, you have said that in the last days you are going to have a people that are going to prophesy again before many nations and tongues and, and languages and kings. Lord, I pray that we can be found faithful when we visit our friends, when we visit family, when we speak, what we watch, that we will set no wicked thing before our eyes. I pray that you will strengthen us and encourage us, help us to be that light, not bigoted and um, high-minded but humble to learn in the school of Christ and the meek and lowliness of Christ. I pray that souls may be encouraged and that you will help us as we go through the book of Daniel to understand what this book means to us. And as we're told that when we as a people understand what this book means to us, they will be seeing among us a great revival. So we pray for this revival and reformation to begin in our hearts to cleanse us. And that we can be daily asking, Lord, what will thou have me to do? Give us willing minds and willing hearts to do all that we see from your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.